Hello and welcome everybody to the Real Freedom Podcast where we talk about building time and financial freedom through opportunities in real estate. And for so many people, they experience the financial freedom first to be able to go get the time freedom. And today's guest, Sarah Weaver, is a great example of doing everything all at once together. And so she is somebody that loves adventure, loves great experiences, and you'll be able to hear from her how she's been able to travel the world and build and grow her investment portfolio at the same time. So just a little bit about her. So right now, she currently owns 14 units in four different states, which she's accumulated pretty quickly here over the past kind of 12 to 18 months. She has four different companies. She hosts events for real estate investors. She has a design service company, and she also has a book coming out. And so there's a lot happening in your world, Sarah. We're so excited to have you on the show. And we'd love to just hear a little bit more about your background and how you got to where we're at today. Absolutely. Well, thanks for having me, Mike. I really appreciate it. And I love that your podcast is focused on freedom of time because that was so important to me. Um, Even mm -hmm. back when I first started, even before I invested in real estate, I wanted to have freedom of mobility um, because that meant freedom of time. So being able to fly on a Tuesday and ask my boss if I could work on Saturday instead of Tuesday. And so I worked remotely um, back in 2015. So seven mm -hmm. years ago, I had my first job where I worked remotely for a real estate recruiting company. And that's when I really understood the power of time. I thought, wow, this is amazing. Most people have to take off time from work to go salsa dancing in Buenos Aires, Argentina. But that was just a normal Wednesday night for me. And then on mm -hmm. Thursdays, I would go to this um, coffee shop that turned into a bar and I would practice my Spanish. And I just was really brought um, light to the fact that I was living a life that I had always dreamed of, even on a really, really small budget. And then I think something shifted that said, you know, I don't really want to be on a really small budget forever. And so what can I do to create passive income so that I don't have to give up this lifestyle of being a digital nomad or location independent? And I frankly wasn't making very much money. I was making less than 50,000, about $52,000, I believe. Mm -hmm. And it just, it was a, it was a great salary to live in South America. But if I wanted to build a really good life in a large U.S. city, that wasn't enough money to live the lifestyle I wanted. And mm -hmm. that's when I decided to start investing in real estate. So walk through, I mean, there's so many people in real estate that are in real estate full-time and can't get to investing. And so how do you, how did you take those first couple steps? You know, there's obviously the fears and the, the natural roadblocks that people have, but how did you get over that hump to get going? Yeah, I think, I think the biggest thing that you have to do, especially if we're talking to real estate agents, um, I read that 95% of real estate agents don't own rental property. And I believe that because when I go looking for an investor-friendly agent like yourself, I, I have a hard time finding one in a lot of major cities and even small towns. And so I think the biggest thing you have to do is you have to educate yourself. And so real estate investing is investing. So therefore it is risky. It's mm -hmm. not a guaranteed thing. And so what I do is I limit my risk. And so I do that by doing a few things. First, I learn how to analyze deals. Mm -hmm. I think that is your strongest muscle that you have to exercise the most often. Then I find really good deals. So when I invest, I'm really confident in the deal that I'm buying because I analyzed the heck out of it and I analyzed it worst case scenario. Mm -hmm. um, and so that, and then I'm really confident in my ability to have multiple extra strategies. And so if things were to go wrong, like for example, we're in a recession officially. And so I've been I getting hadn't a heard lot anything of, about that. That's news <laughs> to me. <laughs> I've been getting a lot of DMs, like people that are like, are you worried? And I say, no, I am not worried. I um, have like secure income coming. I have multiple streams of income now, which mm -hmm. was really important to me. And then also my property's cash flow. I'm focused on cash flow. So do I want my properties to go down in price? Of course not. Mm -hmm. um, and if they ever were to, that's okay because mm -hmm. my properties cash flow so much. Well, and let's talk about your focus, the types of properties that you've been looking for. Obviously, you have a book coming out talking about midterm rentals and that sort of thing. So what is it about midterm rentals that excites you? And then what is it that you look for when you're identifying those properties? 
Yeah, absolutely. So I love the medium term rental strategy for a few reasons. One is it was my tool or like my weapon when prices started to go up. And mm-hmm. so I knew that I wanted to find a way to make properties that wouldn't normally cash flow cash flow. And that was the medium term rental strategy. So for those of you that aren't familiar, it's similar to the short term rental strategy in the sense that you furnish the property, you may list it on Airbnb. But then I also list it on a website called furnishfinder.com, where Mm -hmm. I'm marketing it to people who are likely going to stay there for more than 30 days. And Mm -hmm. so what that meant for me, as I'm traveling the world and trying to spend some time, you know, doing long hikes or spending time on the beach is that my phone wasn't constantly buzzing on Airbnb requests because I would secure a tenant for 13 weeks. Mm -hmm. So it meant I would have four turnovers a year not four turnovers in a week or two weeks. And so I liked that it was taking less mind space, like as far as like, that's kind of what I call Airbnb. It's great. I I actually have two Airbnbs. I absolutely, or short-term rentals, I should say, and I love Uh them. But what the medium-term rental strategy allowed me to do was create cash flow that otherwise wouldn't be there as a long-term rental. And then also own Airbnbs in kind of unexpected areas. So for example, Omaha, Nebraska, Mm -hmm. I, if you had asked me three years ago, if I would own an Airbnb in Omaha, I would say, no, why? But Mm -hmm. now I have nine furnished units in, or I, sorry, eight furnished units in Omaha. Mm -hmm. And how lucky am I that I'm at 96% occupancy this summer. That's awesome. Okay. So let's talk about Omaha for a second. So what is it about Omaha now that you've had a chance to roll up your sleeves and understand the market a little bit better? What's, what's appealing for that market there? Yeah. So what I like about Omaha is that you have population growth. Mm -hmm. You have a a good price of entry for these homes. So I bought a fourplex um, under Mm 350,000 and it cash flows on average between four and 7,000, sorry, four and Mm $6,000 depending on the month. And so that's a really good deal. And so I feel really lucky that I was able to get in at that price point. And then there's population growth, there's job growth, there's a lot of hospitals. So for the medium term rental strategy, not all of my tenants, but a majority of my tenants are traveling nurses. Mm -hmm. And so I like that there's large complexes, there's multiple major hospitals, multiple major universities. And so Mm -hmm. I have no, no small supply of applicants or tenants to live in my medium term rentals. Now, when you purchased that, that first fourplex, uh, was it currently medium term rentals or you turn converted it to medium term? It was for long-term tenants. And then I slowly converted each of the units to medium term. Okay. So find them, furnish them and then post them and have the tenants come. Yeah, absolutely. And in doing so, people were asking me how I was furnishing from afar And so I actually started a company called Aria Design Services, and now we furnish rentals for investors all over the country. We've Mm -hmm. done 24 units in 10 states now. Well, and it's nice because it's it's a a bit of a learning curve, right? To know what to do. And (laughs) so to be able to to leverage your experience uh, to know what to do and what not to do is, is helpful. Yeah. And I don't know about you, Mike, you work with a lot of investors, but I find that investors come to you and they say, I want to invest in real estate because I want more freedom, more time, more money. Mm -hmm. And then they tell you that they want to open four Airbnbs this summer. And Mm -hmm. you're like, uh, you do know that that's like the opposite of what you just said. Like that is going to take a lot of time and Mm -hmm. a lot of money and a lot of energy. And so I like that I can provide a service to make short-term or medium-term rentals a little more passive for investors by taking the heavy load off. So then you said the average, you know, the average stay is 13 weeks now um, for your tenants. It is the traveling nurses stay 13 weeks on average. That's their typical um, contract. And then talk about to the benefits of wear and tear on the unit versus having a long-term rental or even a short-term rental. What's the benefit there of wear and tear on the unit by having somebody medium term? Yeah, you know, I really like the traveling nurse tenants because they're there to sleep. Um, Sometimes they don't even necessarily eat very often in the kitchen. Like I had a tenant who lived there for 13 weeks and it looked like she barely touched the pots and pans. Mm -hmm. And so they tend to live really lightly 
because they are working really long shifts. And when they're not working, they typically are avid travelers. So they're out exploring the area because they probably won't ever live in Omaha, Nebraska again. And so they tend to leave a pretty light track. And then also I like that I have my cleaners in there. That is the benefit of the short-term rentals. You have your cleaners in their eyes and ears on the property so often. And so you benefit from that with the medium-term rental as well as you have your cleaners in there every 13 weeks. Yeah, that's nice. So, okay. So talk through the growth. Um, from kind of your your first property that you got to where you're at today, it it has been pretty quick. Um, so how are you able to take what you had as your kind of initial asset and and blossom that to where it is today? Yeah, absolutely. Thank you. So last year in 2021, I went from three units to 15 units in um, about three months in less than 90 days. And then this year, I added another four units. And so I have 19 units in four states. Mm -hmm. And it did happen really quickly last year. But I think the part of the story that I think it's important to tell is that I bought my first one in 2017. Mm -hmm. I bought my second one in 2019. And then I spent all of 2020 sad and frustrated and upset that I wasn't going under contract. And so that's the beginning of the story, which um, I think a lot of people like to skip over because it's a great headline, three to 15 units in 90 days. Um, But the reality was, is that it took a lot of time. And I think that's why I mentioned at the beginning, it's so important that you have to learn how to analyze deals. And then you have to learn how to find deals because those, those skill sets will take you to the next step. And then you have to learn how to finance them. So Mm -hmm. to answer your question, like how I finance them, I think is important as well. So the first three properties I purchased were all owner occupied house hack. And Mm -hmm. so my like life motto is live where you want and invest where the numbers make sense. Mm -hmm. And so I think it's really important that people don't listen to that and say, oh man, so I'm going to have to move. No, you don't have to move. You don't have to house hack. That just is my story and how I got started. And then from there, I did an equity partnership. Mm -hmm. I did a hard money, private money, burr, hard money, private money, burr for my next one. Mm -hmm. And then I did another equity partnership and another equity partnership. And so I had to start getting creative once I stopped having a W-2. And, and that's the key. Yeah. I mean, depending on where people are coming from and depending on what their income source is and how stable it is, lend, different lenders of different sorts are going to look at things differently. And, and, and what I've learned too, in my time working with investors is um, not every lender works for everybody. And there's certain lenders that work really great for people depending on their situation. And so you kind of have to, it's a little bit of a match make, right? Depending on the, the requirements and the restrictions that lenders have, matching up with what your personal situation is and and finding that right fit. Absolutely. And that's where the power of private money, hard money, creative financing, seller financing, equity partners, debt partner, whatever it is, that became a really, really key in my ability to scale. So as you've now continued to grow, talk about the other businesses that you have on top of your, you know, you've got your different streams of income. So now you have some consistent rental properties that are, you know, spitting off a, a decent amount of income. Talk about now being able to add those other pieces on top of that and be able to fulfill your, your dreams of being able to travel and be adventurous and do that as well. Yeah, it's really cool, Mike. I think like 22 year old me would just be in awe of the life that I live. Because Mm -hmm. for a long time, I mean, I've been traveling for a long time. Like I have been remote for seven years. I've been fully nomadic living out of my suitcase for three and a half years. So Mm -hmm. even when I had a W-2, I, you know, reported to someone Monday through Friday, I still was living nomadically. The difference now is that I'm my own boss. And so when someone asked me to speak to a real estate brokerage on how to invest in real estate, I can hop on a plane and go do that. Mm -hmm. If I get invited to speak at a conference, I can go do that. And what happened um, kind of naturally is that people were so interested in my travels that happened to be real estate investors. And they said, oh, I wish I could travel with you. Oh, I wish I could travel like you. And it just naturally came that I hosted an event in Guatemala and it sold out within a week. Mm -hmm. And so... I realized that the desire to like be in community with other people who are in pursuit of exactly what your podcast is about time and freedom, that desire for community and connection is like deeper than ever. I think with Mm -hmm. COVID and the pandemic, people spent a lot of time alone and as a result are feeling lonely. 
And then also just the journey as an entrepreneur and someone in the pursuit of financial independence, it's additionally lonely because all of a sudden you look around and you're like, oh, like the friends, like my buddies from college, we're not really the same anymore. Mm -hmm. And so you have to seek people that have the same values that you do. And that's why I'm so excited to host these events all over the world. So I have an event coming up in January where we are going to hike Patagonia together. Mm -hmm. And so, and then I'm hosting another event in Guatemala in December. So mm -hmm. there's just a lot of really exciting things happening that really have merged both my desire to travel and real estate and invest in real estate. Yeah. And as, as we're recording this right now, you're in Mexico. Um, exactly. It's fun to see your travel and it's fun to see you be able to do what you want to do because yeah, so many people make excuses or you know, have reasons for why they can't do certain things. And my natural nature, right? I'm, I'm more of a risk averse person is to kind of ask why your natural personality is to kind of ask why not, you know? Yeah, absolutely. And I'm actually really glad that you brought that up because I think when I talk about travel, um, I want people to think like whatever that thing is for them. So for mm -hmm. you, it's spending more time with your kids. Um, it's mm -hmm. coaching them in sports. It's taking them on a vacation, it's spending more time with your wife, it's spending more time doing physical activity, whatever that thing is, I'm not telling everyone that they should like, you know, buy a one way ticket to Argentina. That's not a feasible lifestyle for very many people, or right. a desire for very many people, frankly, mm -hmm. um, it just happened to be my desire. And so I'm really lucky that real estate investing now affords me a life where I can do that. Well, and that's, that's the reason why I wanted to start the podcast over a year and a half ago now is to be able to highlight different people doing different things, building wealth and gaining time and financial freedom through opportunities in real estate. And it's really meant to be where, you know, if, if somebody hears your story, they can, they can relate to that and say, oh gosh, I can do what Sarah does and I can make that work. And then there might be somebody that listens to this episode and says, no way, Jose, that, that just doesn't work for me. But then they listen to another episode and it resonates with them. And so it's to be able to provide a diverse experience for people and, and different opportunities to where somebody can latch onto that and say, yeah, I want to do that. Or to be able to see one part of that, you know, to be able to see that you can combine your real estate investing experience, the knowledge you've gained, the connections you've gained to do events, to be able to coach people and to be able to take the, the wisdom you've learned and monetize that through even something as small as the purchase list that you have. You can go on your website and, and buy a list of things that you want to help furnish your rental, right? You're using your experiences to be able to build those multiple streams of income. So even if it's not travel the world like Sarah does, there's a lot that you can take from this episode of here's how I can stack my learnings on top of each other and build those different streams of income so that I can go do the things that I want to do. And yeah, if it's not traveling, great. It's, it's just, it provides you the opportunity to do the things that you want to do. Absolutely. And I think that that's for a lot of people, that would be my challenge to anyone listening to this is like, what, what do you want? Like, what do you want to do? Because mm -hmm. a lot of people, you ask them that and they're like, oh, I actually don't know. And it doesn't have to be big and grandiose. I mean, when I first started with real estate investing, I just wanted like a few material items that I frankly couldn't afford or couldn't justify before. Mm -hmm. And now that I have them, I'm really excited about them because I don't own very many material items because I travel all the time and live out of my suitcase. And yeah. so that was like something that was really exciting to me. And then I think with the medium term rental strategy, what I encourage people to do that are listening is really think differently about real estate investing. So look at your portfolio with a different lens of, am I being a great asset manager? So what I do now is I look at all of my properties and I figure out, am I getting the best cash flow for this? For, and if cash flow is like your, your strategy. So if you're a cash flow mm -hmm. investor, are you getting the most cash flow? Or could you furnish the unit for as little as $6,000 and get increased cash flow, or in my case, double the rent? Mm -hmm. And so that's exactly what I did with a lot of my properties. Yeah, it's a different lens to look through because, you know, we've, we've had these conversations on my real estate team about being creative in this market, right? Interest rates are going up. Um, we're continually look, looking for opportunities. And yeah, sometimes you have to look at a problem at it from a different angle to see what potential is out there. And so, um, you know, you had mentioned Furnish Finder. I, I can't tell you how many team meetings we've had over the last three to six months where I've said, okay, 
let's look at some opportunities here that might make sense. We're so used to doing one thing a certain way, and we have to develop a different set of tools and a, a tool belt to be able to help different investors meet their needs. And so finding that midterm, medium term rental fit is certainly a great opportunity. Like you said, higher rents, you're working with a group of people that probably won't wear and tear your property as much as others. And like you said, in, instead of running an Airbnb, which can be very lucrative, and maybe you have to be more attentive to your phone or more day-to-day -day maintenance, now you get a chance to find that mix. And so it's a strategy that fits your lifestyle very well um, versus a lot of times people just think long-term rental, here's the rents, here's my expenses, and there's maybe not enough margin there, but you can find a, a nice spot here, a nice niche that really can work. Yeah. And then especially with your market, I mean, they're cracking down, the, the city's cracking down on short-term regulations. And mm -hmm. so that's the nice loophole with medium term is that there isn't a regulation on a 30-day rental in, mm -hmm. in the city. And so that's another reason that I love this strategy is it creates increased cash flow that otherwise isn't there as cities start to crack down on short-term rental regulations. Mm -hmm. What would you say, because I've heard a few folks talk over time about, um, you know, this kind of traveling nurses idea had, had kind of spiked because of COVID, because there was a need. Um, talk about the long-term play here. Um, you know, where, where would you see that going in the future? Yeah, absolutely. We are seeing a steady in the request for uh, traveling nurses mm -hmm. because there were still so many vacancies. And mm -hmm. so I have not seen a dip in the inquiries that I'm getting in my short-term rentals. And I think as an investor, you have to always look at how am I going to stand out? Because mm -hmm. if traveling nurse requests ever were to go down, mm -hmm. how are you going to manage to continue to cash flow? And so I make sure that my short-term rentals look so much better than my competitors. That's the, really the beauty of the medium term rental space is that you're not competing against these beautiful Airbnbs in your town. If you go to Furnish Finder right now, whoever's listening, I guarantee that you're going to be shocked by the level of photos, the level of decor, and the lack of options in your market. And that's mm -hmm. where a really beautifully decorated unit comes into play. And so that's first, like my first defense against any kind of traveling nurse limitation. Mm -hmm. um, next is being really sure that you're in a market with multiple hospitals. So that if one, if you're relying on one hospital and they start to limit the number of traveling nurses contracts that they give out, you're mm -hmm. not going to be hurt by that. And so mm -hmm. I like to invest in a city that has at least five hospitals. Mm -hmm. um, ideally three major hospitals is kind of my, and then a, like a hospital complex is always a good idea. And then as close as you can get to that hospital complex, depending on the city. I know that that can't be a blanket rule for some mm -hmm. places where the complex is located in a dangerous area, but that's really important. And then you have to remember that you don't need 30 people to want to live in your place. You just need one good tenant. Mm -hmm. I wouldn't be okay investing in the city that only has one inquiry. Like I don't want to be, I don't want to have to say yes to that one inquiry. I do want multiple inquiries. But mm -hmm. you don't need to have 50 inquiries. You only have one, maybe five units tops in, in, a, in a market. Mm -hmm. Well, talk a little bit about the, the future and where you want to go and where does this continue for you? Yeah, absolutely. I am, I'm in growth mode, both with my portfolio and my company. And so I'm currently hiring for two of my four companies and I'm focusing a lot on company culture. I want to be really sure that I provide um, a really great environment for people to build their portfolios. And if travel and freedom is important to them, that's obviously a benefit of working with me. Mm -hmm. um, and then as far as the businesses go, I want to serve a lot of investors. Um, one thing that we haven't touched on, and I know it's really important to you because we've spoken before the podcast is mindset. Mm -hmm. And so one of the biggest reasons that my events are so successful is because we touch on mindset at the event and that's what keeps people wanting to come back. We're not just mm -hmm. going to a location and hanging out for the weekend. We really are focused on how do we get the life that we want and that we deserve. And some of it is you need to acquire new skill sets, new education, but I'm finding that the common thread through really successful real estate investors and entrepreneurs is that they have a really strong mindset. 
And Mm -hmm. so a lot of my events are focused on that. And so when I think about what my company's goals are, it's to really positively affect hundreds of real estate investors. Awesome. And for people that want to go find more about you, how do they do that? Yeah, my website is sarahdweaver.com. It's also my Instagram handle, Sarah D. Weaver. And you can also email me at hello at sarahdweaver.com. Awesome. Well, thank you so much for coming on, Sarah. I just really appreciate your story, your energy. Um, It's been awesome to get to know you over the last couple of years and just to see the journey that you're on and all the successes you've had and just to see where this is going to continue to go. So thank you so much for coming on and sharing with everybody. Thank you, Mike. I really appreciate it. I am inspired by you and your team and just your ability to serve investors. And so I hope a lot of real estate agents are following your success.